Yeah. No, we're actually, we're actually going to be doing what's called a romp on. That's the reason why we've uh, put these glasses in. Yeah, you, you, uh, do you play romp on? You can. I've played every other time. Oh, Every single liquor sport out there. <laughs> good, good. Should we kick off? Should we make the latecomers yeah. suffer? Yes. Yeah, we'll make the latecomers suffer. So guys, if, oh, sorry. Okay. Are you okay? Sound man, are you ready? Yeah. Gladiators, are you ready? <laughs> right, guys, um, first of all, I, I do want to apologize. I don't know if it's really muffled in the cheap seats, is it? You can hear me. Oh, good, good, good. Good, good. About this far away. There, like that. There you go. There. That's going to hurt. Double <laughs> Oh, I see the type of crowd we got here today. Oh, All right. Um, <laughs> so first of all, I want to apologize um, for uh, uh, my voice. <clears throat> it's a bit croaky. And uh, it's also a, a different accent. No, wait a minute. But you guys have the accent. I have an English accent, so you guys have the accent. So, um, speaking the Queen's English. So I do want to apologize for that. So any phrases that I come out with that are crazy English phrases and uh, can someone who's ever been to England please translate to me? If I say things like pavement, you know, I mean sidewalk, yeah, all that type of stuff. Rum, well, rum's universal. <laughs> rum of an age. Yeah, rum of an age, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, rum, does anyone like rum, by the way? Hey! Was that a stupid question? <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, I love rum as well. In fact, before we start, I have to do one of the ceremonies. Yes. Just pour a little, pour a little rum on the floor to uh, get rid of any bad vibes, bad energy. That's for all of our relations and our friends that are not here at the moment or have passed away. Um, it does get. To, it does actually get rid of. Ghosts as well. That's that's what we believe, especially in the Caribbean. Uh, we pour a bit of rum on the floor. In where my parents are from, Jamaica, um, we pour rum on the corners of a new house, and that gets rid of what we call the duppies, uh, which are the ghosts, uh, and any bad vibe or bad energy. If you build your own house, you pour rum on the foundations of the house again to bless the house, uh, make sure that foundations are going to stay there for the test of time. And we wholeheartedly believe that in the Caribbean. I don't know if anyone's ever saw ever saw that film Poltergeist. Yeah, you know the little girl got kidnapped by the TV. Yeah, but you do know why there was ghosts inside the house. Exactly, there was vodka inside the house. <laughs> That's the reason why. So if there were rum inside the here, the girl would have been at school the next day talking about I don't know, Justin Bieber or whatever. <laughs> kids talk about nowadays. So uh, very, very important. If you buy a new house, or if you build or buy a new bar, pour a little bit of rum on the floor inside there before you step in there, before you open up, and you will have good tidings. Because I know a few bars that you probably know. Yes, sir? Question. Yes? Oh, sorry, I'm going to get to that part. I'm going to get to that part. <laughs> just talking about rum, just the reason why, I'm just saying the reason why I put a rum on the floor. <laughs> oh, no, 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 I'm going to get back to that part. I was just saying, if you go, uh, have a new bar, just make sure you pour rum on the floor and spirits won't disappear. Um, unless you have greedy bar bags. But yes, good, good, um, good observation. Who am I? My name is uh, Ian Burrell. I'm going to press this. I'm the uh, Global Rum Ambassador. So that means I travel around the world, drink rum, um, talk to fellow bartenders, talk to rum lovers, talk to rum companies. Um, I get paid for doing it. Work sucks. Yeah, it does. It, it does. Especially when you go to tropical countries like Jamaica, which is where my family's from, Barbados, St. Lucia, Haiti, Tampa, all these tropical places in the world just because of rum. So that's who I am. So you can see me, that's my bar in London. Um, yeah, you can see I'm a little bit of a vodka assassin, so vodka is dead. And that's me. I don't know where I was there, but it was very cold. So um, some of the things that I do, in answer to your question, um, some people call me cocktail bartender. Mixologist, I know the Americans love that. Uh, Coctologist, that's our new one we're using in England. Coctologist. Um, travel to all seven continents. Um, last year I had the uh, opportunity to actually travel down to Antarctica. And uh, while I was down there, 
was actually uh, set up a little rum shack and uh, made some cocktails. So yes, yeah, all seven continents. Lecture about rum, do cocktails. Uh, last year, uh, last year I actually set up the rum university as well in Spain, and that helped. Uh, bartenders become rum ambassadors for various different individual rums or for brands or anyone just love rum in general you had the opportunity for a week to learn about all types of rums and switch your life remember I'm Jumia Khan so you know my people say you can't even see me now <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Jumia Khan you know you don't see that look <laughs> um, also I have set the world record uh, about two months ago for the largest rum masterclass from Taste of Styles. Very, very honored to do that. We did that in London. Uh, we had in a masterclass six different rums, six, six different master blenders, myself, uh, 400 people, and uh, went off well, quite smoothly until 50 people left after the last, before the last drink. So they got struck off, but we still beat the record. So I'm officially the world record holder for the largest rum tasting. But it's not about me, it's about rum. Because rum for me is, as a, as a, a rum lover, as a bartender, as a restaurant owner, bar owner, rum for me is the most versatile spirit out there. Whatever you can do with vodka, you can do with a light rum. Whatever you do with uh, an age whiskey, single malt, bourbon, you can do an age full-bodied rum. Lots of flavored rums as well that also do, that can double up uh, and work as well as the flavored vodkas out there. So rums are a versatile um, spirit. And that's one of the reasons why I get asked so many questions around the world, so I'm going to uh, hopefully answer some of your questions in uh, this quick Usain Bolt type of uh, presentation because people like Philip Duff like to talk longer than they were supposed to. <laughs> yeah. Don't give Philip Duff an hour to do a presentation because that means two hours. That's if you can cut him off. So some of the questions I'm going to ask today, what is rum produced uh, from? Where is it produced? How did it get its name? Um, how old is rum? Why does it taste better than vodka? And uh, what is what is the best rum? Very no, it's something you guys are always going to be asked. What's the best rum? What's the best rum? So we'll hopefully answer that today. So what is it produced from? By law, and there aren't too many laws when it comes to rum. Rum has to be produced from a byproduct of sugarcane. 100%. You can't produce it from wheat, grain, rye, potatoes, um, sugar beet. Although there are some countries, especially in Europe, some old Eastern Bloc countries that are still making spirit from sugar beet, adding some caramel to that and rum flavoring and calling it rum. But they can't put rum on a label anymore, especially as they've joined the EU. So be careful when you're out in Europe, Czech Republic, Hungary, Poland, there's some nasty product out there that have been sold as rum. And uh, yeah, they'll poison you as you go blind. So that's one of the rules with rum. It has to be made from a byproduct of sugar cane. Now sugar cane is an important part of that, of the makeup of rum. So I'm gonna just touch upon that. They traced sugar cane back to about 10,000 BC, a little while ago, Papua New Guinea. Anyone been there, Papua New Guinea? No divers here? No divers? So oh, you missed the joke there. Uh, oh, you do? Yeah, I know you do. You tell me to do this with the microphone. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so 10,000 10, BC is where they trace sugar cane back to. And if you want to go scientifically, it's about it's all about a bug and the larvae. There was a larvae that ate sugar cane. There was a bug that ate the larvae. And they traced those two, the bug and the larvae, back to 10,000 BC in Papua New Guinea. So they've concluded that there was sugar cane growing around that particular time. But as man has found this, this grass that produced honey without the aid of bees, that sweetness, as they found that they've decided to transport it and take it everywhere they've gone. So they've taken it from the Far East, they brought it to countries like Spain in 750 AD, that was the Moors, um, 1430 was Madeira, that's the Portuguese, Canary Islands as well, uh, just off the coast of Spain, and that's where Christopher Columbus brought the sugar cane from when he brought it to the Caribbean. In, on his second voyage in 1493 to the Dominican Republic or Hispaniola. Same year, Cuba, Mexico, Brazil, 1530s, that's where the Portuguese brought sugar cane and they started creating spirits like cachaça as well. 1640 Mauritius and Louisiana was seen as the first place for sugar cane here in the United States of America in 1760. Woo! Somebody say, woo! I'll be wave the flag. Yes, passionate. <laughs> there you go. So, 
So where is it produced? Rum is produced all over the world. Rum is, as I said, is a true global spirit. Um, because it's made from sugarcane, it's normally made in sugarcane producing countries. And sugarcane can only grow in tropical climates. There's lots of rain, lots of sunshine, no frost that will kill it. That's why you can't get sugarcane growing in the UK, except for in my back garden, my yard, sorry. Um, if you go to my house, you'll see sugarcane growing there because there's a ray of sunshine actually comes down on I'm, I'm bullshitting you. <laughs> but no, you can't grow anywhere where it's frost or cold, it will kill the sugarcane. So tropical countries, fruit, but basically between the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn right around the world, you'll see rum being produced. And this is the reason why there are so many uh, slight different rules and regulations on rum, and everyone has their own interpretation of what rum is. And some of the most popular rules, Puerto Rico, to be called a rum, you have to be aged in a barrel for at least one year to be called rum. Uh, Venezuela, two years. Europe, to be called rum, you have to be at least 37.5% alcohol. I mean, there are other rules, but you can't have rum that's less than that. Australia, again, it's two years. Guatemala, all rums have to be made from syrup, cane syrup, as opposed to fresh sugar cane juice or molasses. Uh, English Caribbean, they have a minimum age statement, just like single malt. So if there's a five-year-old on an English Caribbean rum, like a rum from Jamaica or Barbados, that's the youngest rum in that blend. They don't do Solera blended or minimum age, uh, sorry, maximum age. In. And in the States, all rums have to be any proof to be defined as a rum. Yeah. So there are various, there are various different rules and regulations on what rum is. Now, how did rum get its name? Now, there's lots of different, lots of different people say, oh, rum got its name from here, like the French. So we French here today. Good. I always pick up the French. But the French, <laughs> they say, yes, rum came from us. Aroma. When you smell the rum, you smell the aroma. And that's what they, the, some of the historians call the word rum came from. Poppycock. Rubbish. They come from there. The Dutch, they tried to say that rum maybe came from a, a drinking vessel they had for their Geneva called a rummer. Rubbish. The Dutch couldn't even sell properly. That's why no one speaks Dutch. Everyone's <laughs> they could build the boats, but they couldn't sail. They couldn't conquer an island. How many? Yeah, Aruba, Bonaire, where the hell are they? They're the only places that speak Dutch in the Caribbean. But everyone speaks English and Spanish. They were the best. Well, the English were better. <laughs> but uh, most of the historians will agree that the word rum comes from an old English word called rum bullion. And rum bullion actually means an uproar, a tumult, lots of noise, boisterous. Something that you guys aren't at the moment, but I know after the happy hour will be rumbullious. It will be rumbullion. So that's what happened when a lot of the English people in the Caribbean were drinking this 70% alcohol, fiery cane spirit and getting drunk and boisterous. So uh, rumbullion was the name that was actually given to this product. And there are a couple of documents that back this up. Um, there was a guy named Giles Sylvester in the 1650s writing about Barbados, and he made a, did a quote, uh, said a quote that the chief fuddling they make on the island is rum bullion, alias kill devil. That's another name they call rum, and it's made from made from sugar cones distilled in hot and hellish and terrible liquor. It, it was a bit fiery. I, I mean, I wasn't around back then. Maybe he was Robert around those times, <laughs> but I wasn't around in the 1650s. But Apparently, yeah, it was very hot and hellish. Remember, people were very small back then, so imagine now drinking 70% alcohol, pints of it every day. Oh, rum bullion. So that's where the word rum came from. Now, we condensed it down from rum bullion to rum because if anyone's ever been to the Caribbean, you know that we are very idiot bark. In fact, sometimes we're so laid back, we're horizontal. <laughs> so, rum bullion is too long a word. Um, for the word rum, so we condense it down to rum. So how is rum made? Now this is the part that I always have to give a, a warning to before, in any country I go to, because in some countries it's legal to make your own rum. And I get some bartenders or some rum lovers who run off and they say, ah, oh, shit, this is easy. I'm going to go make my own rum in my garden. Now I don't know if that's illegal in America. Can you make your own alcohol in the States? I mean, spirits. You can distill moonshine. Oh yeah, moonshine. Yeah. Sturdy and stupid. Yeah, go no, yeah, you guys do this. But anyway, so anyway, so I don't have to worry about you guys making your own rum and going blind and blowing yourself up on your own little pot stills in your gardens. Good, excellent. So, uh, rum, pretty much like any other spirit, 
out there. You have your, uh, your, your base material that produces the sugars. You want to ferment that with the addition of water and your yeast. Uh, you age it and then blend it or just drink it straight. So this is my garden I was telling you about. Go over the way the sunshine comes down. Oh no, I told you that was bullshit, didn't I? Yeah. Well, if you imagine this would be my garden, that would be me cutting sugar cane. Sugar cane is from the grass, frankly. It can grow anywhere from 6 foot to 14 feet high. We harvest it once a year. At the moment, in a lot of the Caribbean countries, it's harvest time now. So they're cutting down that sugar cane, ready to crush uh, for fresh cane juice, or to boil that juice into a syrup, or extract the sugar from there and make rum from the leftovers, which is molasses. This is my little cane crusher. Put my cane inside there, squeeze the juice out, and produce some fresh, fresh sugar cane juice. Amazing, yep. I'm sure most of you have been to the Caribbean, or even in Tampa, I know there must be sugar cane growing around here somewhere. Yes. Ah, oh, good. Yeah. Right, so you get fresh sugar cane juice here. <clears throat> Brilliant. Uh, hopefully you get some. Because I love it in cocktails a lot. It goes really nice with a nice rum, squeeze of lime, add some more sugar to it. Sip that, nice refreshing sugar cane daiquiri. Um, but this is the product that's used to make um, certain styles of rum. Um, one of the rums is the agricultural styles of rums, or the French rums, uh, as we like to say. So they will make their rums from fresh sugar cane juice. Also the Brazilians make their cachaça from fresh sugar cane juice as well. So there's a, a lot of synergy between cachaça and what we call rum agricole. And we do have an agricole here that we're going to taste a little bit later. The other product um, that is used by quite a few rum companies now is syrup, cane syrup, um, or virgin cane honey. Uh, there are some rum companies that have great marketers. You're a marketing, aren't you? Good, okay. Um, some great marketers, and they come up with really fancy names for their raw materials. So virgin cane honey. I've been speaking to a few uh, um, rum producers, and I've asked them, what is virgin cane honey? I'm like, shit, I don't know. <laughs> my, my, my cane honey is as virgin as any. It hasn't had any sex with anybody. It hasn't done this. And I'm like, wow. So it's just a marketing term. Maybe it hasn't been used before. That's what they probably mean by virgin. But then it should be used before. So virgin cane honey, which is just cane syrup, um, again, that's used by some rum companies because fresh sugar cane juice will start to deteriorate within 24 hours, where syrup will hold its own for a lot longer. So you can store this and use it a little bit later. And as I said before, rum from, say, Guatemala. You see Guatemala on the label of any rum bottle. That rum would be made from virgin cane honey or syrup. Um, one of the other popular rums out there is Diplomatico from Venezuela, uh, which is a blend of molasses and syrup. But most rums will be made from the byproduct of sugarcane, molasses. Um, the word miel, uh, honey, from Portuguese or Spanish. When you taste it, I do like sometimes to have a little bit of molasses that people taste, but I'm assuming most people have tasted molasses before. Good, no, yes, good. We'll get some for later. I know you have rum. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's like a bittery, liquish type of aniseed type flavor. It's about 55% still sugar content inside there, fermentable sugar inside there. But this is the base material for most rums. Put about 90% uh, of the worldwide rums are made from molasses. So if we get our molasses, some other products, some people are using Demerara sugar, or one company I saw in Hawaii are using the dehydrated, dehydrated um, sugar cane juice, which for me is just sugar. But again, Mark is in there. Dehydrated sugar cane juice. So once you've got your sugar base, like your molasses, you add your water to that. And then your yeast. Yeast can come in various different guises. The old traditional Jamaican or English way of making rum was natural yeast inside the air. But now companies are cultivating, creating their own yeast or just buying a baker's yeast to add to that molasses and water. And as we know with yeast, um, even if you cultivate and create your own yeast, this particular rum company cultivates their yeast from pineapples. So um, once you've added your yeast to the sugar, uh, the, the yeast eats the sugar and creates gas and liquid. It's, it's sort of like um, Carlos. Imagine Carlos was a yeast. Yeah, imagine the big yeast, big yeast from Chicago. And we threw him into a swimming pool of baked beans. Okay, okay, I got it. <laughs> We're just trying to imagine that. So he's there swimming away, but to survive, he has to eat all the baked beans. So he's eating away, eating away, eating away these baked beans. But after a few uh, 
Yeah, send me a point free. Send me a point free, send me a flag. I mean, certain things will bore, uh, other volatiles will actually bore a little bit lower, some will bore a little bit higher. It's the part, it's the low part, it's the dangerous part. Because when people are making rum in their gardens, like I was saying, you mustn't do, but you probably will do, some people were collecting the alcohol, well, it wasn't even alcohol, it was methanol, and they were drinking that, and it turned them blind, which is where the word blind drunk came from. So be careful when you're making your own shit. <laughs> Yeah, just buy it. So once the alcohol gets bought, it gets condensed down in our condenser for our worm, our swan neck, and then our worm. It'd be about 35% alcohol by volume. We then want to distill it again to get it up to, let's say, 70, 75%. And that's a good drinking stroke. 35 is ah, too weak. That's like a spice rum. Nah, we don't drink that. Well, if it's a good spice rum, we could. But yeah, we want to get up to like 70 or 70% alcohol or 140 proof. Um, so the English style of rum would use pot stills, alambic stills. That was a traditional old way of making rum in the 1600s, the 1700s, and early 1800s. And again, they would use the same technique as any other distillation. You're trying to, first of all, get rid of your aldehydes, your methanol, which is the first alcohols that will boil. Then you want your heart, the good safe part, your ethanol, between 78 and 82 degrees. And then the tails, the end wine, the, 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 the high wines, again, you can either throw those away or you can redistill those. Or you add a little bit back to the rum just to give it a different flavor or a different finish. That's what you'd do. That's why you'd use a pot still. With a pot still as well, you're also um, you're doing batch distillation. So you're stopping and starting. Once that's all gone, clean it out, start again. Tires the process, but it creates a heavier style of rum. There's a John Doe high as the pot still there. I don't know if you can see that very well. Can you? I don't know, because of the lights. Oh, lights down? I don't know. Can everyone see it very well? No. Yes, no, no, yes, no. Yes. You can. Oh, good. Okay. Yes, you can. You can. No. 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 They're up there. No. Yeah, they're right behind. Oh, that one there. But if you turn that one on, you won't be able to see me. Yeah. <laughs> oh, maybe if you turn these ones on and turn this one down. Yeah. No, 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 you want to see, I know you've got a cute lady next to you, you want to see her, I have to Right, so, oh, sorry, it's fine, everyone gets it. Um, this is the one inside my other garden as well. You always have to have a good old pot still inside your garden when you want to make your own bootleg rum. But most rum companies are using continuous or column stills. It's much more efficient. Uh, you can consistently make rums 24-7, 24-7, 365 days a year. Uh, and it works the same process as a... Uh, principle is a pot still, you're adding the wash in the top, the steam will rise through here and strip that 10% or 8 to 10% alcohol from the wash. The steam comes through as vapor through here and as it hits these plates it condenses down back into a liquid. The lower part of the column will pick up, it will pick up the heavier uh, styles of spirits and the lighter spirits will be at the top. Your model column is still there. This is a big industrial column still. Uh, this is in Trinidad. Everyone's a good to Trinidad. Ooh, love Trinidad Carnival. Kind of so, um, <laughs> Wait, this is a. Did you do it again? Uh, sorry? Did you do the wiggle again? <laughs> oh, no, I can't do that. Like, people start running out here and say, oh my god, this crazy English man started dancing. <laughs> um, so, when you've got the rum off of the still, there's one other law you need to remember when you're making your rum. Besides, it has to be made from a byproduct of sugar cane. You cannot take your rum over 96% alcohol by volume. It has to be under 96 to be defined as rum, or you lose all the, the, the flavor, the natural flavors of the raw material, which is sugar cane. So most rums will go up to about 95.7% alcohol on a column still. Um, but some of those rums are not just used for blending um, or mixing with or selling onto other rum companies. Sometimes the locals, they steal it and then give it to the tourists, which is great. You want to see the tourist eyes roll. So if you ever go to a bar in the Caribbean or in the tropics, Philippines, I know they do there in the Philippines as well, you go to the bartender and ask him what the local moonshine is, and he'll go underneath, grab that, wink at you, pour that out, you can see the glass melting as well. <laughs> Put some ice in there quickly and some water and drink that, but it's a great experience to try the local moonshine or the rums that have been stolen from the distillery. <laughs> but there are lots of different names. Uh, in Jamaica, we call it Jum Probati or John Crowbatty. Now, that actually translated into John Crow's Bottom. 
a jar full is a vulture, so it's the liquid from a vulture's ass. <laughs> That's what Jamaican bootleg rum is called. If you ever go to Trinidad, it's called babash. That's normally made in pot stills and gardens. Very illegal, but it's still widely available. Um, Mountain Dew as well in Dominica. Pitoro, they once been to Puerto Rico and they make Pitoro out there. And Dilombic, if you ever go to the French islands or Mauritius, Petit Lombic, bootleg rum. Highly recommend it, especially if you're professional drinkers like most of you guys are. I wouldn't recommend this to a tourist. So once you've got your rum, you now want to give it some character. Or you can sell it, as I said, as unaged rum or aguardiente, as they say in a lot of the Spanish islands. Or you want to give it some character, make it mellow by sticking it inside a barrel. And the most popular barrels for rums nowadays are American oak. So once used bourbon casks. Because as you know, as you know, you can only use those barrels once. That's why the bourbon industry is so not green. <laughs> All the trees that are chopped down, these poor oaks are chopped down for beautiful bourbon. But you can't use those barrels again. But the rum industry, wow, we just take the recycled barrels. We're very green friendly. We use those barrels sometimes up to 20 years, maybe twice for two 10 year old rums, four times for a five year old rum. No, we're, we're, we're a bit more green, I think, in the rum industry. Um, plus, I suppose you want to just keep the, the American tree choppers into, in business you know, as well. But I heard rumors that the rules might change. They might start using reusing barrels. Really? Yeah, I heard. Whisper. I don't know. Angel Net finishes uh, their finished rye, finishes rum barrels. Oh, the finished rye. Yeah, but it can't be called bourbon. No, it's no. rye whiskey. Oh, all right. Yeah, yeah. Rye whiskey, yes. Yeah, <laughs> but with the bourbon industry, yeah, they can only uh, use uh, boy, they can only use barrels once. Quite a lot of the rum companies I know will have deals with, say, Jack Daniels, and use those barrels to age their rums. Um, as well, so it's great for the rum companies to buy these cheaper barrels. Not so good for the for uh, the, the tree, the, the, sorry, the green economy because the trees are being chopped down. Can't really see this picture very well because it's so bright. But that's uh, one of the distilleries in Guyana, aging rums in various different types of casks: cognac casks, sherry casks, whiskey casks. And then we have um, Solera aging as well, which some companies will use to actually age and blend their rums at the same time. And it's a, a great technique for some rum companies and we, we've all come in contact with Solera rums. Yeah, over here. Excellent, excellent. Are we all know Solera rum? No? Oh, oh, well, good. We have someone there. Uh, let me just borrow you for a second. Let's come on, come on for a second. <laughs> Should've said no. Should've said no. We ha can't have someone leaving without not knowing what I'm talking about. <laughs> right, so your name is? Tamara. Tamara. Nice to meet you, Tamara. Say hi to Tamara. Hi, you work in a bar? Yes. Good. Brilliant. Which bar do you work in? Uh, o Bar at the Ambassador Hotel in Oklahoma City. Oh, nice. Oklahoma City. Oh, I haven't been there yet. Which is probably why I haven't seen Yeah, well, yeah, that's probably why you haven't seen me. Okay. <laughs> but when you leave here, you're going to be the, the biggest rum expert in the whole of world. You'll be the Oklahoma Rum Ambassador. Okay. Yes. Brilliant. So, anyway, so imagine you are a barrel of rum that's been aged for 15 years. Okay. okay. <laughs> It was like a barrel. So, you say tomorrow? Tamara. Right, so tomorrow. I'm <laughs> tomorrow is. Oh, Tamara, Tamara, Tamara. Tamara. Right, okay. So, Tamara's the uh, barrel of rum has been for 15 years. And if I take out half the rum from her, sell that to uh, you guys here for like 30 bucks a bottle. Premium rum. It's Oklahoma rum. 30 bucks a bottle. You guys are happy. You start telling, selling it in your cocktails, telling all your friends, and you come back to me and say, Ian, I need some more of this rum. And I'm like, oh shit, I've only got half a barrel left. So what I can do, I can either wait for another 15 years, or I also have, I'll borrow you, sir. <laughs> and your name is? Tony. T Tony. Tony, good name. Tony, where are you from? St. Pete. Oh, just across the bridge. St. Petersburg, not the one in Russia, but just across the bridge. So Tony, imagine Tony is a barrel of rum in nature for 10 years. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yes, exactly. So I can wait for Tony to age another five years, and I'll have one and a half barrels of 15 year old rum. Well, in fact, no, you'd be 20 years by then, wouldn't you? Yeah, so I can wait for 15 years to have the minimum of another barrel. Or I can do my Solera blended, which some companies do it, or some countries like to do, like Guatemala likes to do that, or Central America, Mexico as well, with some of their rums. So if I get my first barrel, yeah. My second barrel, yeah. Be careful. There we go. So what will happen with my Solera system? 
is I'm going to empty out my, uh, sorry, Tony's going to empty out his 10 year old juice into the 15 year old. That didn't sound right. That didn't sound right. No, no, no. no. <laughs> so, um, so Tony's going to empty out the 10 year old rum <laughs> into the 15 year old barrel, into your 15 year old barrel. Right. Okay. So, <laughs> stop that. Stop that. You <laughs> And I'm going to let that mix together for about two years. So instead of waiting five years for you to mature to 15, I'm going to get the rum mixed mix together. And what will happen is the 15-year-old rum will educate the 10-year-old rum. So it should taste very similar to a 15-year-old style of rum. And I can now sell half of you to you guys for 35 bucks. Price has gone up. Um, but I can't call it, especially in Europe, or if it's an English style rum, I can't call it a 15-year-old rum because there's some younger rums in there. But I can call it a 15 Solero rum, yeah? So that's why if you ever see Solero on a bottle, yeah, and it has a number on there, that, is, that represents some of the oldest rums that are in there, not the youngest rum. But then I hear you say, because I know you were saying that, you say, well, so can't you put some even younger rums in there? I'm like, yes, you're right, sir. You looking down, making notes in your phone. Yeah, you are right, exactly. <laughs> so if I can borrow you. <laughs> no, I'm joking. So imagine me, if I was, a big, strong, strapping five-year-old rum. Ha <laughs> ha, you thought you'd have a woman sandwich, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> it would be the same principle. Five-year-old rum into a 10-year-old barrel, leave it there for a couple of years, 10-year-old rum into the 15-year-old barrel, that then gets served, and we'd still sell that as a 15 Solera, although there was some five-year-old inside there as well. Yeah, so when we're looking at labels of bottles, decipher the label, if we see Solera on there, know that it's a blend of rums uh, that are very young, up to a certain age as opposed to minimum age. Yeah? Cool. Thanks guys for helping me out. Are there any regulations on Solera blending or are you kind of just rolling the dice? Like what's the what's the rule there? Like what's the rule there? Pretty much roll the dice. Um, there are there are regulations in regards to age statements in some countries. So to be sold uh, in Europe my particular rum here could not be, could not have the word 15 years old on there. It can have 15 Solera, but it can't have an age statement. Now, for us, we know that we're in a trade, but for consumers, sometimes they're like, oh, that's a 15 year old rum, and they buy it because they see the word 15 on there. So, uh, it, but a lot of these rums taste great, so it's, it's okay. It, basically, what we're trying to say is enjoy what you buy, but be careful what you pay for. That's, that's the message when it comes to it. You don't know about the percentage at all. It's all a secret. You'll never know the percentage unless you actually really know the master blender. Um, so it could be 1% of the oldest rum inside there of a particular number on a particular bottle. There could be 50%. It's about the blend. It's about the blend. And some of them are cleverly done. Different styles of barrels to give different finishes. Yes, sir. Yeah, but with the time, the, the base barrel that is close to the uh, to the suelo, that then it To the bottom? Yeah, because yeah. all, all the smell rolls will come from yeah. the bottom. Yeah, not from these ones, they just the, add. Yeah. The, the percentage is when it goes down. It would do. The percentage yeah. could go down. And then I, my question now is like uh, when you brew the, the 15, it's because you start the solar system with a 15 year old, but it could be like a 30 year that you're using that solar Yeah, it could be like. And it want to be 15 because it was the one that you used. That was the one you used first. Okay. So that's the. so. So essentially, yeah, there could be a lot older rooms inside that particular bend because you've been doing this system for like 30 years, as you said. But the base style that you're trying to create was that original 15 when you started off your Solera system. Yeah, but yeah, 100% right, 100% right. Okay, so the rum comes out of the barrels, gold. Looks a bit gold here. Um, final presentation, what are the different types of rooms out there? Um, rooms can be broken down into various different categories. The simplest form is the final presentation. So you have traditional rums, uh, rums made from molasses. These are English style or Spanish style rums. Um, I just want to have a little nose of the first rum, which is the one closest to you. Let me just make sure it is. Yes, it is. Just have a little nose. Don't have a drink yet, unless you already have. Rhonda. <laughs> Give it a little whirl and just have a nose. Any particular aroma that jumps out on you on it? Funky Jamaican. You yeah, got funky Jamaican. Yeah. Yeah, funky yeah. Jamaican. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but pineapple, too. Pineapple, yeah. Anything else? You're drinking it! I can't help 
And the, the way they used to find that out was they put gunpowder inside the rubber, set light to it. If it burnt with a true flame, it was proofed. If it didn't burn, or it burnt with a small flame, it was underproof. Probably meant some of them watered it down. And that's where the word overproof came from. Yeah, the fact that you could burn gunpowder inside that liquid. So you'll see that on some bottles that are over 54.5% alcohol, old proof. Then you have the premium age rums. These rums have been aged for like 10 years, 15 years, as good as any single malt or any cognac out there. And I do challenge new drinkers or existing uh, bourbon, whiskey, malt drinkers to try some of these aged rums and they'll be blown away about their sippability. And this is where we're seeing growth around the world in the rum category, specific rum category, the premium rum category, has shown an amazing amount of growth around the world. Um, popular cocktails, I'm always asked, what are the most popular cocktails around the world? So I'll quickly go through some of these. The Mosquito, <laughs> still the most popular cocktail in the world. Everyone still asks for the Mosquito. Uh, sorry, Mojito. Because I know no go home you go back and say, yeah, I found a new drink, it's called Mosquito. Um, <laughs> so yeah, the mo Mojito. Um, very popular. That's normally bars in London on a Saturday night. Always like that. And then you always get some person that comes up and says, I have 10 mojitos, please. Making a way, money the way, and they come back after you finish the last one. Oh, sorry, one more, one more, one more. <laughs> hate that, hate that. Um, the planter's punch, still very popular, or a punch of some sort. Uh, simple recipe, one of sour, two of sweet, three of strong, four of weak, five of spice to make it nice. Yeah, that's the rum punch, the rum punch or the plant is punch recipe. The word punch is a Hindu word for five, because original punch had um, arak, which had been a cane spirit from the Far East, would have tea inside this, some water, some lemon, some sugar, five ingredients. And then they came over to the Caribbean, came to the plant as punch. The Cuba Libre, unfortunately you can't get Cuban rum here legally, but I do like to smuggle bottles in every now and again. I forgot to actually smuggle one for this session, but maybe next, if I get by next year, I'll bring one for next year. But share. I did in New York. You can share. <laughs> I'll share. I'll share anything with you. <laughs> right, so yeah, Cuba Libre. I am. I did use a fake name. Because Cuba not free. That doesn't exist. Yeah, no, free Cuba doesn't exist. <laughs> Although, question, one question, quick question. What's the difference between a Cuba Libre and a rum and coke and lime? The lime. No, rum and coke and lime and a Cuba Libre. No, lime juice. Coca-Cola. Oh, huh? no. Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola? Yeah. Alright, what about the Cuba Libre has Coca-Cola in it? If they both look the same rum, no. same rum, same amount of lime, okay, I tell you the difference, three bucks. <laughs> Put it on your menu. Put a Cuba Libre there for three bucks more than the rum and coke, yeah. same measurements. <laughs> Customers will pay more money for the Cuba Libre. <laughs> Seriously, it works, it works. Yeah, marketing, psychology, <laughs> same thing, but extra. The daiquiri, uh, natural daiquiri, none of this uh, blended stuff with red coloring inside there, although they can refresh it in a nice hotel in the Caribbean. Uh, so we have the natural daiquiri, or uh, I know rum company started promoting the handshake and daiquiri. Um, can't remember the name of the company, but uh, they were owned by Roy Hennessy. <laughs> I did mention the rum. Uh, the Mai Tai, another one of my favorite cocktails, again, because the tiki culture is growing around the world. So the Mai Tai has made a resurgence coming back. The original recipe using a 17-year-old grade of Jamaican rum, heavy, heavy, heavy rum, lots of uh, uh, lime, some lime juice, some orange, some orange curacao to bring out the orange notes of the rum, and uh, a little bit of rock candy syrup. Pina colada, again, because of the tiki revival, very, very popular cocktail now, very easy to make, and it seems like pina colada, the pineapple and coconut flavor just pops up everywhere. Uh, when I make my pina coladas in my bar in London, we use a coconut puree. Uh, we also add a little bit of half and half in there as well. Sorry, half and half, um, but half and half. <laughs> um, but I always say, be careful because you know, cream is very calorific. And uh, if your customers look like this, it's brilliant. Put lots of cream inside there. But if you look like that, then uh, cut down, cut down on the cream. Okay, that's, that's a warning. Yeah. No, no cream for your customers that like that. Please, responsibility. No <laughs> Right, so. Back to rum number one, English style. Grab rum number one. Now you can drink it. <laughs> rum number one, English style. Well, I won't say English style, the old traditional style. This was the first style of rum that really was promoted around the world. This influenced rums like New England rums uh, down in Medford, down in uh, Rhode Island. I know there's rums out of Boston, Massachusetts. These are all influenced. Australian rums were influenced by English style rum. Barbados was in, uh, influenced, well, it was an English style rum. 
So there's no age minimum statement. English style rooms are a blend of pot and column, or just pot still, that heavy style room. So a lot of that big, funky, Jamaica funk flavor, as someone said, is the pot still. So that's rum number one, if you still have it. If you don't have it, there's some extras here. <laughs> I love it. How about Jamaica? Woo! Woo! What do you get on the taste? What do you get on the taste? Get a lot of heat, a bit of leather, smoke, tobacco. Tobacco. Yeah. It's quite chewy, quite meaty. I like to call these like the islas of uh, the rum world. Big, not as peaty, but really big, heavy, and meaty. And that's what we call the English style of rum. More common to Jamaica, which uh, has its uh, it has like a um, uh, classification. Jamaica is the only country in the world that has a classification when they're actually making heavy, heavy rums. But a lot of these rums are made for blending. Um, English styles, as I said, uh, evolved into rums from Demerara, from Guyana, from Barbados. They helped the New England rums um, grow, and Australian rums. I put together a little rum taste map, and if we look at comparing different flavors like uh, aromas that you'll pick up from rums, like your sweets, your dries, woody notes, fruity notes, and, and the fruity flavors in between, a lot of English rums will sit in this area here. So more towards the heavy, smokiness, woodiness, um, the summer fruits and the fruits will be there, but not as evident as the bottom notes, the heavier notes at the bottom, which are the leather and the smoke and the tobacco, the big, big heavy aromas that we pick up on the rums a little bit later, or as a rum sits inside the glass. Okay, so that's our English style rum. Rum number two. Remember that one? Remember this one was? You don't remember? So again, with the French style rums around the agricole, this one's been aged for about four years in cognac cask, in Zinc cask. We get a lot of dryness, so it's more towards a dry and sweet. But we're still getting, I'll probably get a lot more of the fruity side, fruity flavors, than the wooden smoking peppery notes. Again, this is just a guide, it's not definitive. So if we had different rums, they might sit in different areas, different French rums might sit in different areas of this group here, depending on the brand because everyone would have their own little different secrets of how they age their particular products. But just to show how they sit in relation to some of the other rums or the first rum. Taste. That's like a sipping rum. Yeah, yeah. It's a lot drier, lighter. Not as heavy as the first one. Or you say, why use one rum? You could use three or four or 20 if you want. So we created, we created their, you can create your own rum as well by just using a little bit of the Jamaican rum um, on the base of a French style rum. So rum number three. What aroma are we picking up on here? <clears throat> I talk about aroma first because 90 to 95% of your taste comes from your sense of smell, so it's important to get a good aroma before you can taste. Vanilla. Get a vanilla? Yeah, a bit of vanilla. That, would, that should come from the wood. Dried fruit. Bit of dried fruit, yeah. Do you say this is a, a, a full body heavy rum or a lighter rum, medium body? Lighter, yeah. Definitely lighter than the first rum, the Jamaican rum. Yeah. Sorry, this is a quick guy. So, the French style rum, I went, up, went ahead of myself because I know we're running out of time. Uh, rum agricole, fresh sugar cane juice, must be fermented within 24 hours, uh, cognac casks. Um, this is the rum. Any idea what style of rum this would be, number three? Spanish style. Process elimination. <laughs> what do you say? <coughs> Have a style. No. <laughs> so light, medium bodied. Um, column still. This is column still. There's no pot still in here whatsoever. It's none of that heavy, heavy rub uh, from those Atlantic. So if this was unaged, this would be an aguardiente. Yeah, fiery cane, fiery cane juice. Charcoal filtered. A lot of Spanish style rums, um, original ones, were charcoal filtered. In fact, uh, Facundo Bacardi in 1862 was one of the first to start filtering his rums through charcoal to try to compete with some of the lighter spirits on the market and create a different style of rum as Jamaica, and Barbados, uh, St. Saint, uh, Saint Croix or Santa Cruz at the time dominated the rum industry. Whiskey barrels and Cuba also was one of the first to embrace 
the Industrial Revolution uh, as well. So they helped the Spanish start roads, as well as other things. Prohibition, we're here for a pill day. That helped Spanish roads dramatically, because as you know, the Americans were going down to Cuba, America's saloon, and going down there and having drinks, and drinking lots of Cuban rum, Spanish Latin style rums, drinking mosquitoes, and daiquiris, and swizzles, <laughs> and uh, having fun, and like, yeah, rum is fun, and coming back to America and saying, shit, you guys, if you guys could afford it, you should come down to Cuba, you peasant. <laughs> But yes, that's where Rome really got its, uh, its renaissance. And, uh, and then other styles of Spanish rums developed, like rum from Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is one of the first countries to create uh, an official standard of rums, where they said it has to be aged for a minimum of one year. So Puerto Rico started creating their own style of rum, which was like a hybrid of, of these rums, much more lighter. Cuba, again, has a particular style of rum with a lot more uh, woody notes inside there, but again, it could bring Cuba. Hello, hi. hi, nice dress. Right, so, <laughs> run number four. <laughs> Have a nose, a taste. <laughs> Any particular aromas coming up from here? Cool. Yeah, get a vanilla, caramel. Can you get a little bit of butter, but coconuts? Yeah, yeah coconuts. Is this the tender white silver? Uh, it is, how'd you know? This is the blonde. This is the blonde, the rum blonde. Which category would you put this? I mean, where would you put this if we're looking at the uh, Spanish? Uh, the rum, yeah, yeah. Put it in Spanish. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I definitely would put it in the English, but yeah. French mix. Yeah, could, yeah, verge over. I think a verge over with that. Yeah, on the cusp. Yeah, but definitely, I'd put it into if I was if I was looking to make cocktails of this in my bar. And I'm using Tandelite inside there. I'm looking for some of my lighter styles of cocktails, my daiquiris, my mosquitoes, sorry, mosquitoes, um, swizzles, things like that that can really take advantage of the subtle flavors like the coconuts and the coconut daiquiris um, will work in there as well. Uh, light Presidentes, um, a bit of, or oh, if you're doing an orange curacao version of the Presidente inside there and the dash of grenadine and the dry vermouth would give that nice stir. Again, really taking advantage of the subtle flavors of this particular rum. Ooh. And taste wise, it's nice. mm -hmm. yeah. I'm not just saying that because I know there's some tanned white people here, but it's not bad. <laughs> yeah, it's not bad. Yeah, it's got a lot more flavor than I'd expect from typical Spanish styles of rums because they're going to be much more lighter. And that's mainly because the demand uh, of the market at the moment. America is the biggest rum drinking country in the world, but 80% of the rums sold here are pretty much from two islands. And that is a particular, particular Spanish style that they feel the American market wants. But with you guys now understanding and learning more about flavors of various and other spirits as well as rums, we can now push and market the better styles of rums, better quality rums, rums like the Tandoy Silver, as a light rum to use in a light cocktail. And now the American market will be there ready to accept it. And that's where we're seeing, as I said, growth in the market. So yes, this is where I put, I put the Tandoy rum about here. The silver inside the Spanish section here, light, still getting the tropical fruit in there, not as heavy as some of the other rums, uh, less smoky, um, not as much peppery notes, but still uh, versatile, light white rum. And the last rum, rum number five. That's caramel. Bit more of a caramel uh, flavor coming in, sweet caramel. A lot more of the vanilla, and also getting some orchard fruit, a bit of apricot. Yeah. Any other, any other aromas or flavors picking up from there? What about the taste? Nutmeg. Bit of nutmeg, bit of spice, yeah. <coughs> yeah, a lot, of, a lot of, a lot of flavors working there. A lot of that would be would come from the barrels that they use. What master blenders will do will have certain barrels that will give certain amount of flavor. So the master blender tender, I can imagine they would be like, well, these barrels are giving me a lot of vanilla notes. Those ones are giving me a lot of fruit notes. And these ones there are giving me some citrus or maybe some other notes. And they'll blend those together to come up with their final blend. The tender white white, as you saw, has got a little bit of color with Asian. These are rums aged up to five years old. They don't put an age statement in the bottle because sometimes age Age statements can be a detriment to the actual product for some products, especially in hot climates. So this one's been aged for up to five years, and this one's been aged up to seven years. 
And that's a lot of a lot of aging for a young rump. Or for a rump value for money. I'm not sure the price. What's the price of these rumps, sir? Nineteen ninety nine for the seven fifty is the suggested retail price, but it gets down to seventeen ninety nine wow. retail. Wow. Now if I look at that in other terms, um they want the whiskey, Scotch whiskey trading before. So we know when a whiskey is aged in the cold climates of Scotland, you're losing about 2% every year. Well, in the tropics, you can lose anywhere from 6 to 10% of your product every year through aging. This means, let's say, for example, this rum has been aged in the Philippines, where I know it's very warm and humid there. They'll be losing, they'll be aging three times as fast as a single malt whiskey. So a rum that's been aged for up to five years has up to 15 years of maturity if you equate that to Scotch whiskey. Now, if you taste the whiskey up to 15 years old, I know you're not gonna get that for 17.99. <laughs> so rum, you get more bang for your buck because of that tropical aging, that, that fast maturing. But be careful, remember I said, enjoy your drink. Be careful what you pay for. There are a lot of, some rums, some other spirits that they've put eight staples in their bottles and They've been sitting in the barrel for a long time, but they have been blended well. It's like we all know someone very young that is very mature and been looked after, well nurtured by their parents. And we know some people tearaways as well. The parents are like, yeah, go and do your own thing. And they're, they're the ones you see on America's Most Wanted. And they're like 14 years old. And we have some old people that are very mature as well, or immature, like myself, <laughs> as well. So you have to nurture your product. <laughs> No, I don't. We didn't finish. <laughs> we didn't finish. Um, so be careful what you pay for. So I would put the Tundra White Gold a little bit more towards the fuller bodied, uh, a little bit more sweetness uh, than the, the silver, the dry, but still within the Spanish Rome region uh, on that particular map. Again, if you guys are doing this, you might move it in slightly different ways. But this is just an example of a guy. I also like to use this for simple menus for my customers. So I can put like five or six rums like this on a mat, give that to the customer, and the customer says, oh yeah, oh I've got a sweeter palette, I'll have that sweeter rum, or oh, I have a drier palette, I'll have that drier rum. Especially if you're in a busy bar, you don't have time to actually go through uh, the individual rums. But that's a great thing about the rum category, there are different rums for different occasions. But that's where I'd sit uh, the two Tandawais. So just a summary for the Tandawai. 1854 was when the brand was founded, eight years before Bacardi, or Barbara Cool, so we're talking about a lot of history and heritage there. Uh, silver rope, up to five years old. Gold, up to seven. Good thing to remember when we are making our old style of uh, daiquiris with a little bit more flavor than some of the other rums that are, on, uh, that are available. Second biggest selling rum in the world. Wow. That means they're selling a lot of rum. That means one of you guys might win that trip to the Philippines. One of you guys have a golden ticket under your chair. And if it's not under your chair, it might be under the ones that should have been there, but there's a golden ticket under, under one of your chairs to win a trip to the Philippines. No way. Well, right. That's freaking good. Awesome. That'd be freaking awesome. Alright, I'm not bullshit, I'm bullshit. Robert was like, oh shit, I didn't remember this in the budget. <laughs> um, so we all agree, we all agree that what's going on at this room, this room would sit in the Spanish Spanish sector of, um, of our rum portfolio. So we know um, how to actually promote it and how to actually sell it within our bars. Um, and if we were replacing it or using it as instead of another particular rum, that's how I look to uh, that, that's how I look to actually uh, use it in a particular drink instead of another Spanish style of rum. So the last question um, <coughs> for you to be left with: What is the best rum? The one, the one you like. Wow, you're good. You done before you. Yes. The one in my glass. But it's actually two other rooms that are just as good. The next one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and there's one more important one. A free one. Uh, a free room. That's the three most important rooms, best rooms in the world. So guys, sorry I ran out too late because the Irish guy next door was speaking too long. But um, I don't know if you probably wanted to say anything. No? Yeah, I do. I want to thank you, Ian. Oh, no. We have a stand for oh, your knowledge. Oh, Jesus. Wait a minute, before you do that. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Oh! Go oh. <laughs> just get rid of bad vibes. There's a lot of, there's a lot of spirits. <laughs> anyway, on behalf of Tandwai Asian Rum, I want to thank each and every one of you for attending the seminar. Um, I've been in this business for many, many years, and I tend to pick up bits and pieces. 
Just to let you know that Tanabai is relatively new to the United States, even though we're 160 years old. How old are we? Yeah, 160 years old. Exactly. It's amazing that this type of spirit, or the quality of the spirit, hasn't really surfaced to the United States or Europe for that matter. So technically, looking at the USBG, looking at the directive from the category itself, we are a craft spirit. We're trying to develop uh, the US. We're only in four states right now. Um, by all means, if, if there is something that uh, you feel that would fit into your establishment and what have you, feel free to contact me at any time. I'll just ask a couple questions real quick. Where are we from? Anybody from the Philippines? Besides you. You said that? You, sir? What size are you? Don't, don't, don't say it too loud. Medium. Beach medium. How old is a five? Uh, how old? 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 Here? Uh, here? Uh, here? I'm sexist. Good to <laughs> <laughs> Let me see what other questions uh, should I ask you. We are aged in what? Oak barrels. Oak barrels. Okay. Good. And we do, just to let you know, we, we age our rum in used bourbon barrels. So it tends to add quality, consistency, continuity. And the young lady and Tony, I'm going to just throw you these shirts. Tony, for being the Soleros. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, each and every one of you. Have a great feeling. We appreciate it. All right, guys. Thank you for spending the day with us. There is a bus uh, uh, ready to take us all to the happy hour. Everybody, just get on it. I love you, everybody.